Hi and welcome to this episode 3 of Land Rovers Live. I'm Matt Cooper and as always with me, Jeremy. Hello there, and if you've been paying attention you'll have noticed that we've changed a few things on the show and certainly changed a few things on the website. We've got a nice new forum, so we'd like to get involved with that. And as always, if you've got any questions or any ideas, please do get in touch with us by the various means available, Carrier Pigeon, Twitter, Facebook, whatever, and uh, we'll always entertain your ideas because they might be better than ours. Yeah. Um, and we'll put the links below for that. So, as Jamie said, we've got a new forum section. So any any advice, any feedback, uh, we value all of your feedback and we've had quite a bit of it so far. So we've put a new forum in place for that. We'll, as I said, we'll put the links on the screen below. Um, we're going to take a look at what's coming up in today's show now. Uh, I guess we've got news as always. News as always, yes. And part of the news is this new Land Rover we're sitting in, or at least new to Amy. Yes, that's is, right. Is why we're sitting in it. Yes. So for the more keen-eyed of you, uh, we on our text blog section, which if you haven't seen it, we'll put some links down below as well, uh, our assistant producer, Amy, she, well... She didn't really know one end from a Land Rover from the other. Well, it's a bit harsh, yeah, it's a bit harsh, but she certainly wasn't uh, inclined to go and buy a Land Rover when she went to the Land Rover show. No, so uh, so whilst we were at Billing, Amy and her other half, Josh, got their first real taste of Land Rovers. On the back of that, we find ourselves just a couple of weeks later sitting in the back of, uh, of Amy's newly purchased... 1995 110 and it's uh, quite it's, a specimen it is. Yeah, it's a shame we don't pair enough to get a Range Rover HSV. Yeah, it's quite. Anyway, so we better take a look at what's coming up in today's show. Uh, as we've already said, we've got the news coming up. We, we sent Jeremy out to have a look at some interesting products for us this year, uh, this week. Um, how did that go, Joe? Well, I got the short end of the stick. Apparently it's because I haven't had my hair cut yet, so I was putting up tents. I made the intense joke again because I've made that three times already. <laughs> but it was intense. So we'll be taking a look at what Jeremy's talking about a little bit later with that. Uh, also, we caught up whilst we were at the Billing Show with Ant Anstead and Tommy, who did recently on the Channel 4 in the UK for the love of cars, they rebuilt and restored a beautiful Series 1 Land Rover, and you caught up with them at Billing. I did, I managed to catch him just at the end, So, um, and Tom is the interesting guy really, because he's, uh, he's the man who did all of the magic and found all the bits, so uh, you will we'll get a word from him as well I believe. Mm. And th then after that, I went out green laning with a few of the clubs uh, a few weeks ago, we went out with Staffs 4x4 who were a great Land Rover club, and then we went doing the exact same lanes again with Carpenters 4x4 tours. So we'll be taking a look at that and seeing the differences between, uh, well, between the two different parties that went. So now I suppose we'd better get on with the news. Uh, yes, uh, you were going to tell me what the news was. Cause the yes. news I've got is we've got a competition winner, so apart from that... Yeah, well, 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 let's not jump ahead of ourselves. No, no. So, we'll, uh, so in this week's news we've got the Land Rover SVR that we featured in last week's show, the one that went round the, uh, the Nürburgring in eight minutes, not Something, a lot. Yes. Uh, Land Rover of now, or this week, a couple of days ago, they've sent that and done a big launch of it at a, the Quail Car Show in Florida, I believe. Yes, it's hard to believe that this is the state of economy to launch a £100,000 car, isn't it? But mm. apparently it is. Yeah, well, but uh, as it happens, they've, they've done a hell of a lot of work to this Range Rover SVR. There are more specs that are out for it now. And one of the things that we really noticed was actually it's not a lot more expensive than the Range Rover Sport. I think it's about ten thousand pounds or so, fifteen percent cheaper. Yeah, ten or eleven thousand pounds, like four of these. Well, that's true enough, but uh, oh. I, I guess you and I aren't really in the market for. A... No, if you've got to ask, you can't afford it. No, true. Uh, and they will be shipping early twenty fifteen. We're told they're also be taking orders on in October. So. Uh, oh, I'm delighted. Yes. What we wanted was a car that could go off road faster than a Porsche. Yes, quite. So. Um, Moving on, we've also heard this week about the Defender, or the DC100 Defender replacement, whatever we want to call it. Uh, it's sort of a not news really, isn't it? What we have figured out is what it's not going to look like. Um, it's not going to look like what we thought it was going to look like. Well, it's not going to look like the pictures have been banding around, which is a shame, because it was the first ever Land Rover that I saw that I liked immediately. Everything else they've done I hated for years, um, mm. and I saw that and thought, yeah, I can fully like, like that, and now you tell me it's not going to look like that. No, it's not going to look like that. Right. So, what, what we do know about what it is going to look like is that it's nothing like that, and I suspect we're not going to find out any time soon what it is going to look like. Uh, few reasons for that. The, all of the key design features on the DC100, as you probably noticed, have been pinched by other car manufacturers. Uh, 
the recent updates to Skoda Yeti certainly uh, aren't just a little bit like the DC100, are they? So no, no, it's just Skoda Yeti. Mm. I mean, that's... Well, you do like the look of them, Jim. Yeah, well, I hope they're as rare as Yetis. <laughs> yeah, it's quite. Um, but one of the things that we do think will happen is that the new engine plant up in Wolverhampton will be, well, that's producing these new Ingenium engines, which uh, which we've been re reading quite a bit about, haven't we? So what's, what's really great about those engines is it's a well, just a two-litre petrol or diesel engine, and I believe that they actually share most of the same parts, whether it be petrol or diesel, and they just make some changes. I suppose it's all very good news. I'm done if I know why. Well, well, well. well I, mean, I, just, I don't know. I, I like my Defender engine to have a nice Defender engine. I've yeah. Shared with something else, but yeah, I, I, I guess so. I but suppose it's all the cost, cost of production and everything, isn't it? And yeah, but but also the you know it really enables Jaguar Land Rover to do some really interesting things with the engines. Now these engines will be ready to go as hybrids or automatics or okay. full blown. Um, Defender machine. So I think it's pretty safe to say that we're going to see one of these two litre diesel engines in the new Defender, whatever it does or doesn't look like. Um, but we're not really expected to see any more information about what it's going to look like anytime soon. Suffice to say, there will be a gap of production. Uh, we think it's about 2018 19 before we get a new Defender. Uh, we'll keep you abreast as we, as we find more information. But uh, We'd love to hear your thoughts about what you think about it, and also, you know, there's, there's a lot of discussion, and, and you're you're quite vocal about it. What you think a defender should be? Well, it should be like this. Yes. Well, a bit more comfortable, cushions, mm. you know. But this is a defender. I'm, you know, I'm an old school Land Rover guy, really. If you can't drop a Caterpillar track in the back and it doesn't break, mm. then you know it's not good enough. But um, I'm a bit worried that they're going to become a little bit too plasticky or a little bit too cosmetic. Mm. Um, when it's really what I want is a, a pretty tough truck. Yeah, and I guess there are other vehicles available on the market today, the L200, the, the Terrace Mobile, the uh, Toyota Hilux. Oh, um, right, yeah. And, uh, are we advertising those? No, no, I don't think we are, but uh, so, so quite where the Defender's going to fit in, I'm not sure, but I think, like you say, it, it would be a real shame to see it go to become just a... a a plastic non-serviceable Well, I, I, I think it's important for me, and I'm sure it is for a lot of other Land Rover users, that Land Rover is, you know, the, the durable off-road vehicle that's a workhorse in so many environments, and I think it's, it's very dangerous for Land Rover to lose that mark. Um, if, they, if they lose that place to the, the Hilux and all the rest of it, then I think it will affect their standing as an off-road off uh, durable truck anyway. Yes. Well, well, we'll continue this uh, this discussion on the forums, I think, Jim, because we okay. actually could be here... <laughs> all week talking about this so uh well that's it for the news this week and we're going to head along to see what we did with jeremy last week in the product reviews and this issue we're having a look at some uh, leisure equipment well expedition really but not the sort of darien gap or panamanian expedition stuff this is for the family trip out for the weekend the kind of stuff you can fold up chuck in the back of the land rover and hike off to wales or to the pennines wherever your fancy takes you now we've had a look at some tents, picnic gear, and Matt's been looking at some bikes, haven't you, Matt? Well, no good camping trip is uh, complete without some That's bicycles. A matter so. of opinion, but... <laughs> yeah, quite. So, so we've got two great bikes here that uh, we'll take a look at to start with. They're both made by Land Rover, uh, people who, uh, I believe, they make vehicles as well. Do they? Mm, apparently so. Um, but, you know, the... It's Are Land they Rover's made by Land Rover? They have Land Rover badges on them. They do. They right. do. Uh, and they're available on the Land Rover website as well. So Then they're very nearly Land Rover. I would say they're Land Rover, yes. And, uh, and they've reduced the barrier to entry to the Land Rover market quite considerably, I think. So how much can I have one of these Land Rovers for? Well, we'll get on to that in a minute. Well, I suppose I should talk about what they actually do. I mean, at the front here, we've got the 650 Hydro mountain bike, which is a fantastic mountain bike for most things. If you're into any extreme, if you want to ride on the road fairly regularly, the knobbly tyres aren't going to be that great. And if you want to do competitive downhill mountain biking, then again, maybe not. But for for us who ride canal towpaths or a bit of laning and stuff in the, in the forest, I reckon the 650 is a great mountain bike to start with. I quite like the disc brakes and the hydraulic and everything. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think at this price point in the market, that's that's a pretty impressive thing. On the whole, it's a great bike for uh, its price. It's really nicely made. It comes with suspension forks, as, as you said, Jim, hydraulic disc brakes. 
I think the one thing that does let it down is it comes with plastic pedals. It's it's not expensive enough where everybody who buys it might put their own specialist pedals on. Um, so I would have liked to, to come with some metal pedals there because uh, I actually bashed my shins in a few times. But that said, it performed really well and uh, it was a very comfortable bike to ride. Only one wheel drive though? I'm afraid so, only one wheel drive. Uh, no diff lock on that one either. And then the next one we've got is a, is a ladies bike. Uh, the Commute 2.9 and this is not really a mountain bike it's more of a hybrid so designed for poncing around the towns uh, going to the paper shop as such sounds like a Range Rover uh, yes quite yeah, a, a perfect accessory um, there's really not that much of note to speak about this one it's again it's really nicely made the welding on it uh, will be appreciated by Land Rover lovers it comes with a Relatively, relatively average kit all the way over to be honest it does have front suspension forks so that will take a lot of the knocks and bumps out but really I'd say this one was for if you're just a bit of a Land Rover nut and a want to, Support, to buy a Land fly Rover. the flag yeah exactly uh, I mean that said you asked about the price earlier so they're pretty competitively priced the Hydro 650 is available for £380 and this one the Commute is £330 and all in all, they're, they're pretty good fun. And uh, your better half, did she approve? She did. That said, and it could just be down to her, she doesn't actually like this traditional... Girly bike uh, layout. Girly bike layout. Yeah, she, yeah. Said, uh, she doesn't cycle in a dress all that often, and uh, uh, the reality was that she preferred the, the 650, so... M more butch. Yeah, I wouldn't say that to her though, Jim. No, okay. Well, we, we better have a look at something else, hadn't we? <laughs> well, I've been looking at these tents, and uh, these Van Gogh tents are supremely made. I'm not a great tent fan, as you know. As I know. Yes, uh, but having been forced to habitate in these things for extended periods of time, I'm very grateful for the uh, quality they make. They're, all the seams are nicely covered over, so the rain doesn't get into the zips, and they've got little pockets to put things in, shoes mm. and whatever. Even little holes to put your electric, hitch up, um, your electric hookup point through. Although, I've got to wonder why you've got an electric hookup if you're in a tent still. Never mind. I'm sure there are reasons. Uh, but we did a little video of me putting these up, and I wanted to know whether I felt that the air flow system, this kind of business where you just blow up the structure rather than put all the sticks together, was superior to the sticks. And I have to say, I think it isn't. Not for the extra £200, I'd be better off having two of these cheaper tents and I can have the rest of the family somewhere else. Mm. That to me would be more of a benefit. Yeah. Well, uh, well, well, we did send you out as a, as a, as a trial by. It was a trial. Trial by incompetence. Yes. To yes. <laughs> to, to erect both of these tents. So, uh, like you say, uh, the, the, the stick one really. Uh, I mean, we purposely sent you out by by yourself, so you had no help, nobody holding your hand. Was it difficult to put up the, the stick one? It, yeah. It, no, not difficult per se. Um, they're fiddly. Whatever happens, you're doing it on your own. But mm. you've got the same problem. Once you've got the, the, the structural ribs in place, whether it's filled with air or stuck together, you've got to erect it and put the guy ropes in. And at that point, you could be fighting the weather and everybody else could be watching you having a good laugh. And it's the same for both. Um, there's no superior one, really, in that respect. Um, they both do go up and they both go very well and they, and they work brilliantly. Um, mm. But I just don't think that I could be persuaded to spend the extra money for the airflow one. Mm. It looks cool. It does look cool. I, I think the one thing that I can note about these is we, we've taken both of these tents uh, to East North Show, we took them to the Billing Show, yeah. we've, I took them to Normandy. Um, but when we were at the Billing Show, the Harris fencing that we used to protect ourselves from the forces of evil fell down onto the inflatable tent. And I don't know if you recall this. I didn't know. I wasn't there. No, I missed well, that. Well, it fell down straight onto the inflatable tent. And actually, I was surprised that no damage was, was caused whatsoever. But it did make me think, had that same fencing have fallen down onto the, the stick tent, that we might have had a problem there. Really? Hmm. Interesting. I'd almost like to arrange that. Put you in a tent, <laughs> drop a fence on it, see yeah. how it goes. Yeah, it's quiet. But, but all in all, both tents, fantastically well made, aren't they? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'm very impressed with the quality of them. I really am. Yeah, yeah. they're super. I think both tents are available now from Van Gogh, and we'll put the prices and uh, links up on the screen about that. Yeah, I think that's roughly £200 and about £500. So there's a significant difference mm. for having that very sort of well, modern um, air inflatable bit. Yeah. 
but I guess both of these tents are also quite big, aren't they? They're both five-man tents. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I must say, actually, if, the, if there wasn't a difference in price, I would have gone for the airflow one. Mm. I will say that. Right, OK. So <laughs> so if you're stingy, t yep. sticks. If that's not so much of an issue, then the, then the blow-up one. And then, uh, what's yeah, this so, contraption here? Well, then, talking Jeff? about stingy, we've got this awfully impressive picnic set to look at as well. Mm. This is not for cheapskates, though, is it? No, it's not. So this is the uh, the gourmet trotter, coming in at uh, a hefty three hundred and ninety nine pounds. I, I mean, I will say, uh, and I confess this readily, that it is elegant, and there's some very nice touches to it. And I, I like the way they've done the glasses and and the and the original cutlery, which confuses me for ages, but. And it's very classy, you know, um, but yeah. it's not my kind of picnic set. No, I mean, it, it, it's an interesting thing, is it? Uh, I don't know if you saw, Jen, but it was actually featured on Dragon's Den I didn't. Uh, a couple of what, a couple of years ago. Oh, so. I'd love to have heard what Deborah said about this. Yes, well, it's, it's a really interesting product, isn't it? Yes. Uh, and it sort of solves a problem that, that maybe doesn't exist? Well, I don't know. I think, you know, if you've got an oiku picnic set around the place, the fact that it folds onto a golf trolley, but if you couldn't come up with a solution for that yourself, you don't really have that much money to buy it, in my view. Yes. Well, should we talk about what it actually comes with? Because that may yet sway you, dear viewer. So, uh, well, it comes with these three things. Uh, they're actually all take-offable, and I think we'll, uh, we'll show that, because we we've played with this quite a few times, haven't we, and, yes. uh, and destroyed the contents of half of it. So, yes. there are three sections to the Gourmet Trotter, which, which is really quite interesting. The bottom section, you can store all your wine and, well, just wine, really, isn't it? Middle section's got all your crocs and things like that in it. Top section for storing food. And the servant goes on this end. That's right, we, we put our servant on that end, which is, uh, and at that end, you can't really see from, from that, that camera angle, but that's actually just a golf trolley, isn't it? Yes. It's a, so they, you tow the whole thing along nicely. Yeah. It, it, I thought it had a NATO hitch on it, but, uh, no, but not. No. So, as a picnic set goes, it, it, it's, it's, it's pretty big and pretty cumbersome, but when it's actually off the trolley, and that's been our preferred way of using it, just to throw one of the little boxes under your arms and walk off with it, then it becomes quite manageable. There are some pretty cute design features on it, and uh, one of the things that we, we spoke about, well, the longest, really, with the glasses, isn't it? Yeah, the glasses are, are very elegant, and I think it's a nice little solution um, to the sort of, you know, having a proper wine glass that doesn't fall over in the wind, and hmm. uh, yeah, I, 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 it is cute, it is cute, but it's just one of those products that if you have to ask the price, you can't afford it. Yeah. Um, and there will be some very lucky ladies out there whose husbands will buy them one of these, and they will stand out in the crowd. Or, or vice versa. So, possibly, <laughs> possibly. <laughs> so, the, the thing with this, I mean, there's enough stuff in there to feed and water four people, which which is quite good, and carry enough wine and food to to get you well fed and yeah. and, uh, and need to be wheeled home. What kind of per well? Would you see this in the back of your Defender Jam? No. Freelander? No. Ranger of Revoke. Obviously. Yes. So, really. It sits at this end of the market, doesn't it? Yeah. We, there are plenty of picnic sets available at all different prices, but this, this Gourmet Trotter really is aimed at, at the highest level of the market, isn't it? And, yeah. and when we actually came across this, we were looking for, or talking about, when you used to get Range Rover picnic sets. Yes. But, and they were very nice, and of course such a thing doesn't exist anymore. No. Uh, and that's how we, we came across this. So really, where it sits in the market is clearly at the higher end. Um, do you need it? Probably not. I wish I could afford it. Yes. Yes. I, I mean, it, it, I, it's I, a running theme today. We have used it. <laughs> yes, yeah, indeed. We, we have uh, we, we we have used it quite a lot, and I must mm. admit, I, the, the elegance of it and the and the, and the cute design features uh, I did find appealing. Yes. So um, I I wouldn't reject it as a Christmas present. No. I really, well, I think we'll leave it there, aren't we? Because we we could not going to get it as a Christmas present. No, 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 you're not. Right. We, we could um. talk about the Gourmet Trotter and its pros and cons all day, really, because it, yes. it has as many pros as as it has cons, and uh, it is an acquired taste. But it is available now from GourmetTrotter.co.uk, and we'll put the link on the screen for that. Um, and then, lastly, really, the chairs we're sat on now, which seem oh. to be doing an ample enough job. Oh yes, these. I saw these at Billings. I thought you'd been out and splashed out in some fine chairs with bags and everything to put them in. Well, I did by uh, calling Bango and the and the lovely people there have, have sent us these chairs, which, which I have to say, I mean, we get through camping chairs like no one's business, don't we? They they, they fall down, uh, fall apart pretty quickly. We leave them out in the rain; they go rotten. Um, 
and these and these are above average aren't they yeah well above the, average the, yeah they are all camping chairs are not created equally that much no. we, we do know and, and i have to say these uh come in i can't remember how much they are but we'll, we'll, we'll put it up on the screen anyway but they're actually just an evolution of the of the, the camping chair not particularly glamorous but they are very comfortable and they won't fall apart very easily, will no, they? No, they're well made. I'm, I am mm. impressed with them, although I'd like to know how impressed if you knew the price. But Yeah, I think they're coming around £15. Oh, really? Mm. Oh, that's not outrageous at all, is it? Not at all, no. no. They're um, fairly comfortable. We've sat here for the last 10 minutes, and it's yeah. been okay. Yeah, definitely. So, whilst we realise that, that these these aren't all the products that you require to go on a camping trip, they're, they're a few of the important ones, I might think, Jim. Yes, well, the chairs and the tents I'm in for. Bikes and picnic set, not so urgent. No. But of course, in order to keep yourself warm and be fed, we took took a look at the Anave stoves in episode one, I believe. Oh, yeah. Well, I've already booked the traveller, so forget it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, well, that's pretty well it for this week's reviews. So there you have it. That's our batch of this week's reviews. Uh, there's some quite interesting products there, some, some stuff that Land Rover owners may not ordinarily see. Yeah, I think the thing about... Um, Tents. I must admit, I don't enjoy putting up tents. I don't really like living in them either. But the great thing about tents is that they can fit in the Land Rover. You don't have to tow them around, mm. um, and they're ripped for when you need them. So yeah, I can be won over to tents. I just wish they could have fold-up kitchens and living rooms. Yes. Yeah. Well, anyway, as we were, we did mention earlier, or you mentioned earlier, Jem, that we last week's competition. We forgot to draw the results in the news, so I suspect we better do it now. Yeah, well, I've said it's a hell of a prize, isn't it? It is uh, indeed. Oh, whole lovely stove, the Frontier stove, isn't it? No. No, it's the Traveller stove. The, traveler stove. Yeah. <coughs> the big meaty heavy one. That's right. So uh, we ran a competition from the last show. Uh, Which if was you've way too easy. It was way too easy. We, we really didn't think it through all that. Didn't mean to insult you people at all. No, but uh, anyway, the winners. So uh, you may notice I'm not wearing my hat today because it's already been commandeered for for a prize announcement. Do you, do you want to do the honours, Jim? I'll, I'll, I'll have a dip, yes. Is it me? It's not you, Matt. It's not you. It's 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 Pat McCann. Pat McMahon. McMahon. Pat All McMahon. right. Okay. Well, well done, Pat McMahon. Uh, I hope you've got a Ute to put it in. <laughs> yes. Congratulations. I'll just slip it in your pocket there. Right. Well, I thought I'd win that. So. <laughs> so anyway, that's our competition winner. Well done, Pat McMahon. We'll get this traveller stove winging its way to you fairly shortly. So fairly short, you'll have to be pretty short. I don't know who's going to pay the postage. Yeah, so I don't know about that. <laughs> so next up, we'll give away something this week. Uh, last week we had Neil on the show from Landy Lubber. Uh, we quite like their products, don't we? Yeah, no, I especially like the way they package them and organise the, the installation of them. It's clearly mm. them. Yeah, you were you were quite partial to a QR code. Yes. So what are we going to do now? We're going to give away one of their um, aluminium auxiliary switch panels. Yes, it's made of stainless steel, but yeah, it's made uh, of stainless steel, is it? Yes, yeah, yeah, so yeah, even better. A bit overkill, but it, it's fantastically made. Uh, so that comes with uh, iPhone compatible, but any smartphone compatible charging, various different switches along the way, and installs into defenders. Now we're going to make it easier, but less complicated this week. Easier than last competition, right? Yeah. However, I'm dying to hear this. Yeah. So the the plan is our forum, which we've mentioned two or three times already, and we'll put a link below. Anybody who comments or replies or posts onto our forum during the next two weeks will be automatically entered for a chance to win this Landy Lubber 12 volt auxiliary panel. That's it. Couldn't, couldn't be any easier than that. So, one more time, the forum link will be below. Get involved on our forums. Anybody who writes anything, right? I, I suppose we're, we're not allowed. Well, not, not allowed, no, of course. No, we'll count ourselves out. Yes. Otherwise we'd, uh, and, and no benefit if you're a great contributor to our forum and, and make lots and lots of comments. Sorry, you'll only get in the hat the once. Yes. Yeah. That's it. So it's a shame. Uh, we'll try and think of a way of dealing with that next time. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I suppose it is worth mentioning. It doesn't count if you text us directly your answer, which it, which has happened quite a few times. Oh, did it? Recently. Well, so, they are uh, sly, aren't they? Yeah. So so people who text us directly that that doesn't count as a, a as an entry anymore. I'm afraid. Um, Moving on, uh, last week, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I was out green laning with Staff Saw before. Yes, you were. Which was quite nice. I bet it was. Yes, it was. Uh, the week after, I went out with uh, Carpenter's Tours for before. Uh, we went back to the same green lanes again in Wales. It wasn't just happened to be that way. 
So as such, we thought we'd take a look at the differences between what clubs are doing and what the guided 4x4 tours are doing. And uh, well, Presumably they're suitable for beginners, the guided tours, aren't they? Or Absolutely, I followed a freelander around the whole time. That is a beginner. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, but they did a great job, I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed going out with, with both the bunch of guys. So. Yeah. Should we go and have a look and see what I did? Yeah, want to get my hair cut? I'll have a go sometime as well. Yes, quite. So we've been up early today to get to North Wales and we're going out green laning with 4x4 staffs. So we're going to go and join them and see what routes they're doing today. After meeting the guys in the car park, we all set off. When in North Wales, it really doesn't take that long to turn up at some lanes. And it also doesn't take long to find lanes that have been closed. So we turned around and headed off somewhere else. There's a good variety of lanes in North Wales and the Staff's 4x4 lot are a real friendly bunch. Next up, we came to another lane that had been blocked by a fallen tree. After a quick conclave, we'll turn around and head off somewhere else. But not before I manage to get stuck and have to be towed out by the guys. Much to the amusement of some of them. North Wales has a whole host of beautiful sights to be seen. And by checking back on the trailways map, we can find some alternative routes to go down. More or less, as soon as we were back on the move again, the rain started. Just in time to tackle the fairly slippy Pheasant's Pen steps. Now the guys at the Staffs 4x4 are generally experienced off-roaders, and they, they were great at helping us up there. And not too shabby at getting up themselves. vehicles that Staffs 4x4 Club have got are fairly heavily modified. In stark contrast to what we'll see later with the Carpenters 4x4 tours. Once we've tackled the Pheasant's Pen steps it's time for a spot of lunch so we pop the bonnet and talk shop. Once all fed and water naturally we get back on our way and this being North Wales we come across more closed lanes. This time we find out after the fact that this particular lane was illegally closed. This sign you can see is actually a forged document and this lane is fully open. But when we're out it's just not worth the risk. So we turn around again. We covered many routes during the day and of course when you're in North Wales you can't not do the Wayfarer. It was real sad to see when we were up at the Wayfarer the amount of people who've been driving off piste and ruining it for the rest of us. Needless to say the guys at Stas 4x4 respect the lanes and do stay on the on track. After checking out the top of the Wayfarer and doing a couple of running repairs, we make a move again, just in time for us some nice little water crossings. And that more or less concluded our day with Stas 4x4. They were a really great friendly bunch, and I recommend if you ever turn up at the shows, go and say hi to them. They've got some fantastic vehicles. We also did a club spotlight when we were at Billing a few weeks ago. We'll put a link on the screen for that. The following week, we decide to do the same lanes again, this time with a tour company, Carpenters 4x4 Tours. Basically what we do, we give people the opportunity that haven't done any off-roading before, or any, any sort of uh, green laning, they don't know nothing about green laning, uh, the chance to just get their own 4x4s out, uh, standard vehicles, modified vehicles, and come out and just spend the day with us. Kelvin and his team gave great instruction and support, which meant all of those on board the trip, even those that wouldn't ordinarily drive, could really have a good go and make the most of lanes. A nice test to see what these vehicles can do in their stock form was to tackle Pheasant's Pen Steps again. We'd just done this last week with Staff's 4x4 group, and all right, it's dry today, but we were really surprised with uh, the little bit of help and assistance pretty well any vehicle get it. Um, We've got lanes to suit everybody, we can take them like to wide open fields such as this now like with no no overgrowth if they want something a bit more challenging you know obviously they don't come out in a brand new vehicle you know something that the, the mind you know the minor scratch might get on there 
but we, we go out specifically not to damage a vehicle. That is the main aim of it. We always send our questionnaires to people uh, once they've decided to book up, asking what sort of vehicle they've got, if they've got any modifications, or you snorkel, road tyres, off-road tyres, stuff like that. And then we can cater the tour around them once they've given us the area. Uh, that uh, we've got listed in the magazines and on our websites and stuff like that. Yeah. All in all, we had a great time with Carpenters 4x4 tours, so we'd like to say thank you to Staff 4x4 for sharing their Green Landing Day with us, and the same for Carpenters 4x4 tours. So what we've learned is whether you're an experienced off-roader with a heavily modified vehicle, or you're brand new out the paddock in a Freelander, there's plenty that the countryside has to offer, and some lovely green lanes for all. Well, it's excellent fun they're having green laning there. I'm not being a misery guts about this, and I've no doubt that when I get my Land Rover back on the road and I get my hair cut, I will probably be allowed to go myself. But in the meantime, Matt's going to show you. Actually, there's one just thing I want to say about green laning, because this is a very important part of the Land Rover roading community. Do come onto the forum if you've got any ideas or any issues about green laning, particularly if you've heard of any being closed down or sabotaged by your local council. A concerted effort needed by everybody on that front. In the meantime, though, Matt's going to talk us through this wonderful Bearmark app, which will find any bit your Land Rover needs. Yes, quite. So, uh, as, as you may know, Bearmark are one of the partners of the show, uh, which we're more than grateful for. Uh, one of the things we've been using for quite some time when reviewing products, when, well, when trying to repair Jeremy's Land Rover, is to work out what all the different parts are. Now, most of them we know, and those of you who entered the competition, generally all of you knew what the answer was. But we find ourselves more often than not not knowing what it is that we're looking at. Um, and Bearmark have released this app, which we just find it to be really quite useful, aren't we, Jim? So the, the app's quite simple. Uh, it presents itself with all the different vehicles you can get. As you look through it, it'll give you exploded diagrams of the chassis and all their performance. Uh, it's got all the old series on here, is it? Oh, yeah, uh, all of them. doesn't have forward control. Right, only just messing forward just control. Just all, all your stock civilian-issued right. Land Rovers. Uh, right up to date with the Range Rover Evoque as well, yeah, which is neat. quite cool. Um, w one of the great things is that they actually do do so many different products that to suit well, pretty well anything. Like my rear cross member on my the Defender that's at the back here uh, is the wrong one for some reason. Whenever the guys bought it, they decided to put the, the wrong one on. Now, because it's already had a new rear quarter section, actually, I needed. Well, I won't bore you with the details, but I needed, oh. yes, I, <laughs> I needed one that was a little bit longer. Right. No fear, went to the Bear Mac app, and actually, lo and behold, there was that option to get one that was just slightly longer than the rear quarter, so it's a rear quarter and an eighth. Really? Good heavens. Mm, yeah, quite useful. Um, available now from the App Store is the Bear Mac app, and we think it's an invaluable tool for, for certainly part selection and knowing to ask for the right thing. Is actually, is, uh, you just check and see. I'm just looking to see if it's available on Play, yes? Yeah, yeah. Maybe. I, I know that it actually doesn't resolve on an iPhone. Oh. It's only on an iPad, so maybe you. Uh, well, I suppose I suppose if you knew about these things, you'd need an iPad. I suspect so. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, lastly on this week's show, we've got. What, what do we threaten them with? Did we do the competition? We've done the competition, oh, so yeah. that must be that we went to see Ant Anstead's oh, yes, and yes. Tommy's fantastic Series 1 build. Was... Now those guys were at Billing uh, a few weeks ago, and Jeremy caught up with them, so let's go see what happened. Well, well, welcome back to Land Rovers Live, and we're still at Billings, so trying to check us out, but we've had the good fortune to come across Ant and Tom, who are, of course, famously responsible for this wonderful Series 1 route build here. Um, I unfortunately don't know a great deal about Series 1, so I'm going to let these gentlemen explain the magic of these vehicles and the long-standing appeal. And we've got Rich, of course, who's probably got some questions to ask about it. Yes. <laughs> okay, so it, when you started the project, where, where did you begin? What was, um, what was the first thing to do with it? Well, it was to find the project, really, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, we got, we got lucky, was, really. Yeah, but there was a fair bit of effort in finding a, a sort of a complete vehicle that was a valid project and Land was lucky to do that. And we turned down loads of other Land Rovers, so you know, I went to see other Land Rovers in Barnes, but when you come across this car, you knew straight away that this was a viable project. Yeah. You know, the majority of it was there, it was original, had great history, great patina. Yeah. It was a fairly solid vehicle as well. And like most builds, you've got to strip it back and start from the chassis up. So getting the chassis ready first was a priority, get that rolling chassis finish, so suspension, axles, wheels, Next stage was engine. Yep, gearbox. Gearbox rebuild, and then, um, you know, like a big Meccano set, build up with 
so it's the original chassis that you've repaired yeah. or yeah yeah and the bulkhead as well which is both those parts are very important to the uh, the structure yeah. and the authenticity of the car. Yeah. So many of them are, 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 are rusty and need. And you, you can buy new ones, but obviously, if you're restoring, it's nice to repair the original, which yeah. is what we did. Yeah. In fact, the only um, the only parts we replaced on the body were the doors and the ta the tail. Yeah. Really? That's it. This is that original is, yeah, wing, really original yeah. bonnet, original chassis, back body. Windscreen. Just out of interest, how many vehicles did you actually go and view before you found this one? Was there a lot, or were they half a dozen? Yeah, really. There's, yeah. So there's still that many but, waiting but, to be restored by but, people. But, but they specifically wanted an 80 inch. Okay. Uh, this is obviously an 80 inch. So um, you know, 80 inches are always popular. Everyone wants an 80, and um, you know, there's not that many out there to find. So we you had to tick a few fairness. boxes. Yeah. Really they are still out there though. Yeah, yeah, it would appear so. Because you oh, know not. that in a barn somewhere, yeah. probably up north, there's going to be another 80 inch lurking around, hidden under a load of cobwebs and dust that nobody's found yet. Yeah. And how many of them are there? Yeah. And when doing the, re the restoration, did, did you find it easy to source all the parts from all the right places? Yeah, I think it's such a good club network within Land Rover. I mean, look at this show today, it's such a well supported brand. Um, you know, and the, the Land Rover fans are abundant. So getting hold of parts for these vehicles, I mean, Tom's made a career of um, supplying parts to Land Rover owners. So, you know, like most classic cars, there's a you know, fantastic support network, um, members clubs, parts clubs. So, and, you know, there's also this willingness to help each other. There's a kind of a camaraderie within Land Rover owners that exists, unlike any other sector in the world. And, you know, I can phone up a stranger I've never spoken to. They could be a Land Rover owner and that kind of unison I know that they're going to help. Yeah. And, and now the car's finished, um, what's your feelings for Land Rovers and what was your feeling before you started the product? Well, I was Can't always... ask me that because I was born uh, into them. You were born <laughs> into yeah, yeah, he's, uh, he's been a Land Rover baby his whole life. Yeah. But uh, no, I've owned Land Rovers. I had a Defender when I was uh, a younger man and I currently have a Discovery 3, uh, which my wife uses. But you know, of the six cars, this was out now my favourite. Really? I was always a Land Rover fan anyway, but. I had a real relationship with this build, purely because it was such a character. And you know, going into the workshop in the mornings, it was always this car that I went to. And you know, looking at the end results, I mean, the other cars were fantastic, and you know, they were unique in their own right, and they have a bit of you know my DNA and my team's DNA in it. But this car for me stood head and shoulders above the other five. And would you do it again? Uh, and if you were going to do it one. again, would you do a series one or would you choose something different? What well, I mean. I'm actually looking for a series one at the moment. Oh, are you really? <laughs> yeah. Because I'm already right saying this, this was sold at auction after the... Yeah, 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 yeah all six so went So who owns this vehicle now then? So this was bought by Khan Design. Um, so Abzul Khan owns this vehicle. Um, you know, he bought it because it represents for him, I mean, Defender's a big part of his I brand. It's, and yeah. it's the, he calls it the great grandfather of the Defender. Yeah. And obviously Land Rover are pulling the plug on the Defender next year. Yeah. So this is really where it started for Land Rover. Um, what a great big, you know, piece of history, and plus it's the car that you know, featured in the show. And he's got no plans to modify it, let's speak to Oh yeah. God, no, no, <laughs> I, I think Tom and I would run up there with some, <laughs> some slapping sort of, sticks. Uh, agreement that you couldn't touch it. Yeah, no, you, but no alloys on this one. That's all right. <laughs> with the auction, were you, were you expecting it to fetch what it did, or were you expecting it? It more? went higher than I thought. Yeah. I, was, I was hoping that it would, you know, for me, for sort of a business point of view, you know, you, you want the maths to work out. So. We sort of rough, we knew what was put into the car, so we, I, I think that that was achievable to get back on the day, and it made more. So, so from a business point of view, the Land Rover performed really well that day. You know, it was bought for a price, it was restored, and it sold for more than what was put into it. So, yeah, it was a good result all the way around. Yeah. Well, I think what the story did actually was give a lot of credibility to the whole process, didn't it? To show people what you can achieve. Um, oh yeah, pleasure in that time, of bringing but, something back but, to life. But, but not many people have got the garage space no. that we had, and you know there was probably a team of about six really on on that car. Um, okay. Not the entire ten weeks, but but you know we obviously had access to ants, um, sprayers, fabricators, you know, and electricians, for instance. So you know, nice and not everyone would have that because people are trying to do the majority of it themselves. But this could be achieved yeah. at home. It'd know. be more of a challenge, but you could do you it. You could do it, yeah. And, and that's really what I, we urge people to do. I mean, the show feedback is that 
people have been inspired into buying classic cars. I mean, I've been stopped in the street by a number of people who've said, oh my God, I bought a Land Rover because, because I watched that. your show. Yeah. And that's exactly the reason why I... That's so unprofessional. That's one of the reasons that I, you know, I wanted to do the show and, you know, and it's to have young people come up to me and say, oh, you know, I've now booked tickets to go to a car museum because I want to see what a Mark 1 Mexico looks like. Yeah. And, um, you know, people are actually getting their spanners out, finding time on a weekend, and they're restoring these cars at home, doing it their way. Um, you know, we tried to do it the way Land Rover left the factory in 1951. But the great thing about Land Rover is, if you look around today, is that they're all unique. Each one's different, and each one represents the owner. Yeah. So, you put a unique stance on yours. I'll do the same on mine, Tom, and yourself. Yeah. And that that story that car tells will be unique to you and become personal. That's why we all name our cars. That's why we're all passionate about our cars. And you know, if if just one more person's been inspired by the show, then and does this I'm car happy. have a name? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, we Tom. named it after Tom Shepard. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Tom Shepard, what a gem. I mean, this is a guy who not only has a, a relationship with Land Rovers, but he actually relied on them. You know, he, he survived in really harsh conditions, and Land Rover got him out of trouble so many times because it's just reliable and usable and fixable, and it's a tool and a workhorse at the end of the day. Um, but put all the kind of reliability and the fact that, you know, these guys know how good it is and it always perform. Um, it's just great fun. I mean, how many people have come here with families, tents, yeah. barbecues, cool box full of beer, and they're making, spending a weekend, and actually the, the whole, the it's sole pubs that weekend is, 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 is these cars. Yeah. It is lifestyle. Actually, one of the things we've noticed as well, talking to pubs, I think, is, is how family oriented and sort of father-son oriented the whole Land Rover yeah. story is. It's a real lineage, well, isn't it? Well, I can vouch for that. You're, you're, I, I used you're to, the same. You well, know, you also, aren't you? Ten, you know, from 10 years old, I was going to similar, very similar shows to this with my dad, you know, and, um, and you know, I've seen mirror images of that all all weekend yeah. of what's, what what I've grown up with. So yeah, it's a, it's a good. But in the you know the, the heart of it, like you might use the vehicle to camp out of, you know, yeah. the Land Rover's there. So um, yeah, it's a it's a good foundation. Yeah, it's absolutely. fantastic. I mean, there's loads of young people running around with Land Rover T-shirts oh, on. That's brilliant. Yeah. And you know, picking up leaflets from stands. And I know Toys, that these young you know, young yeah. lads are going to go home tonight and they're going to tell their friends at school and they're going to have a little display in their bedroom and it's going to be surrounded by Land Rovers. I can still remember the sound of town and country as when I was sitting on the, on the, on the back uh, drop going along the road and I was about six years old sitting on that old... Uh, humming away. Humming away. Glorious. Not well, too long ago either, right? Oh well, no, no, <laughs> just a few weeks. <laughs> well, thank you very much indeed for your time. It's been marvellous nice talking to you. No problem. And congratulations for your story. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers. Well done, Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> They're the real star. <laughs> So there you have it, nice little insight into the uh, Series 1 Land Rover from uh, For the Love of Cars. And uh, a thoroughly nice chaps by all accounts, Jim. Extraordinary, I must have admired their patience, I really couldn't do all of that. No, no, no. the wheel wrench goes flying when you have to change a wheel, doesn't it? Yes, it does a bit, yeah. So uh, if you yourselves actually want to go and see this Series 1 uh, in the flesh, it's actually sat in the Khan showroom. In Bradford? I believe so. Oh. Excellent. So yeah, that's uh, that's that. But that's pretty well it for this week's show. Again, thank you very much for watching, especially those of you who watch right to the end. Um, if you want to get in contact with us, well, how can we do that, John? Well, we can do that. It's all on the bottom of the screen normally, isn't it? <laughs> on Facebook and Twitter. <laughs> Don't forget, if you want to enter our competition this week, just jump onto our forums, get involved there, and you'll automatically be entered for a chance to win the Landy Lubber Defender Dash Auxiliary Panel. And uh, next week we'll be introducing it from underneath the Land Rover. Yes, probably. Probably. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>